And good evening, everybody. Here we are with uh, part two of uh, the P. Iris painting tutorial. We got Chris here. Last week, when we did part one, we uh, were talking about his model here for P. Iris and discussing how he was going to paint the Mercs for his army. Um, what we did last week was we went over two brush blending and how to make this nice gray color on his cloak. Uh, on the cloak on both sides, we talked about uh, how we were going to do. Um, the color placement for the different colors and talked a little bit about color theory and and developing his scheme and tonight what we're going to do um, I'm going to talk about working with leathers here these the, all the leather parts that I've painted we're going to talk a little bit about um, painting metallics like on the sword and the armor here and then also we're going to spend some time going over painting faces and uh, getting some skin tones going so um, since last week when I was last streaming the only things I've done to this miniature are just um, deepened the gray a little bit here on the cloak cleaned things up a little bit back here cleaned up some of the green on the armor painted all the leather pieces and all the metal pieces um, figured we didn't need to stream that part of it so um, so there it is Chris there's how she's looking right now and, and where we're gonna go from from here so um, speaking of color scheme, just to show you real quick, I did get your, your paint cards made up here. So we've got uh, the one that we were playing around on last week with just kind of throwing some of the colors on there. Um, got all the color recipes here for the, uh, the metallic colors that we're going to be using. The bronze, some highlights, shades, and washes. And I'll go through all that. Uh, got your leather colors here along with the uh, paint names and numbers and how the colors are laying out. Uh, the metallics for the armor, for the, the weapons, whatnot. Uh, green cloth, and then the gray cloth. The only one we didn't do is the, the flesh because I'll be going over that with you tonight. So, And those will be sent back to you when these miniatures are done. Awesome. Yeah. So um, before we get going on the leather that's kind of where I want to start with first um, I actually would like to do a quick thing on the face um, to get that going and then also with the leather as well to get that going because we're going to do some washes and we need to give those some time to dry so um, how's your experience painting faces how do you do with that I haven't really painted any faces yet, so yeah. I mean, like on the on the trolls, I kind of base the faces and try to do a little bit of the edge highlighting, and it looked terrible, and I just stopped. Okay. I didn't even try to go back and do their teeth or their eyes or anything else. All right. Well, what I'll what I'll share with you tonight is kind of my basic flesh recipe. Okay. It's pretty easy to do. Um, this is how I paint faces when I'm painting a large number of miniatures, like for an army. Okay. The first thing I do. Okay is I work with a white primer. So as you can see, I've left the, the, the white primer on her face. Okay, let me bring the focus back in here a little tighter. Um, and that's kind of your base, your base to start from, okay? Um, the first thing you wanna do when you're painting faces, that, or that I do, is uh, P3 flesh wash, okay? Um, I'll put a little bit of that on my wet palette and maybe add about a drop of water with it you don't want it super concentrated and then what you want to do is just get this wash um, going on the face okay and you don't need to be particularly careful at this point you're just letting the wash uh, fill into the cracks uh, the crevices of the face, and kind of so kind of just let the details of the the face do the work for you. Yeah, yeah. At this point, that's all you're all all you're doing with that. You don't want um, you're really not trying to paint anything. This just kind of becomes the base layer of the face, so that when it dries, when you come back to it, it tends to pull the detail out a little more, um, so that as you go to paint the face. Uh, things are just a little easier to see. It's not um, it's not so um, obscure. One dimensional and flat. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. that's I think the big problem with faces is 
how one-dimensional and flat they can look prior to having some wash on them or something like that. So you're just using that basically to, to pick the details out and you can see the, the change that you get on that and how much um, how much sharper the face looks just by adding that little bit of wash there. So while that is drying, let me back out again, what you want to move on to next or what we'll move on to next is <clears throat> using some Army Painter War Paint Washes and this is their Strong Tone and this is going to be the base for all the leathers that I that you're going to use on your Mercs. Um, what I've done as far as painting the leather color, all of the uh, leather straps, armors, quiver, all that stuff has been painted in Vallejo leather brown. It's a nice base color for brown, really dark, has great coverage, that's why I like it. <clears throat> so when you're painting a model like this that has a lot of leather, leather parts on it, you can actually get moving through it pretty quick. And so um, I've painted the, the chest area here, the straps, um, on the arms, legs, uh, again on the, on the bottom of the leg here, quiver, okay, all that, all that got base coated in that, in that brown color. And this, this wash you're just going to use straight. You don't need to, to water it down or anything you know, right out of the bottle. For this type of a technique, it's, it's just fine. Uh, but what you want to be careful uh, about doing at this point, though, is um, not getting too crazy with the wash um, as far as getting it onto other parts of the model that you've already painted. Just get everything coated. Can you use the brush like you did to get the paint off to get washes off? Like um, just a clean, wet brush, or is it a little more difficult to do nope, that with the wash? Nope, it's actually quite easy to do with a wash. You shouldn't have any problem at all um, getting that off. They're, they're very watery, um, especially the Army Painter ones. Um, did you ever play a, a, a 40K, Space Marines, Orcs, that stuff? No. Okay. This is really the first tabletop I've ever done. So. Okay. Well, they um, GW you know has makes their own their own paints, um, and I think you even said that you have some of them. And back in the day, uh, before they changed over to this new paint line that they use, um, they had a a wash that they called Devlin Mud, and everybody just was you know bonkers over that wash and how well it 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 worked and everything. And and this. Army Painter Strong Tone is a real, real similar color to that. So, uh, but since you never played it, then I guess it's not really applicable. <laughs> and so, what we'll do when this when this wash dries is um, we'll go back and pick pick out these leather details in a lighter leather color. Um, and so, this wash is kind of serving as the the, the shading. A uh, quick shading to to the whole area. So really, kind of just take the time to do the two brush blending and stuff on larger areas and a more like a like a more of an accent piece like the cape, and then on the smaller areas, kind of use the shades and the the washes to yeah That's... to do a lot of the work. But it's just not going to be as significant of a difference. Right. Between the wash and the the, well, the two brush on such a small item? Yeah, it's not that it's going to be that much of a difference. It, it, it really, I think, has more to do with, with time saving. I mean, you're, I think that list, that Signar list that you sent me, you've got, what, about 35 models in there? Something like that? Yeah, there's 20 Risen alone. Because so, yeah, well, she can board, she puts nine on the board, but there's 20 you got to paint. So. Yeah, yeah. So, so for me, you know, when I'm painting an army, I can't, I, I can't give um, minute detail attention to every piece in the army. I'm going to go crazy if I do that. And so, I've tried to develop some tricks and some some t um, techniques that help me move a little faster. And and this is one of them. And right now, I'm just kind of applying the wash globally. But you can actually do the wash in a, in a two brush blending manner very easily. Uh, I'll just show you right here on the cape. You know, right now the cape is a, is a very cool gray color. Well, you can take 
some of your wash, you can add a, a drop of it here, you know, just like that. Come in and two brush blend that, and it'll behave just like a paint in that respect. It's a lot more transparent, so you're not going to get the coverage that you would out of the paint, but you're going to be able to blend that edge of it and create a softer finish. And when that dries, it'll give a, a slight brown, uh, not even a slight brown hue. It just it'll just actually soften that gray up a little bit. But we don't want to leave that on there. So why it's still wet, I'm just going to use my my brush and just wipe it off. And that's another nice thing about washes is they're so wet you can you can do that. And so you can already see too. Um, zoom in here a little bit. All the detail that's come out. I mean, the the brown was flat when we started, right. and now it's already kind of yeah. has more of the three dimensional. Yeah. So you're already getting some depth added to that brown. And um, really, what we're going to do from here is just use the base uh, leather color that we started with, and uh, maybe and add a little bit of our highlight color into it, and um, start adding some highlights to this leather. Uh, to make it look more more attractive. Um, the problem with using washes like this over large areas like this cape, like if I was to just take like a their their dark tone version of this wash and put it over this whole cape area, um, your chances of of that wash being blotchy uh, increase quite a bit. And so by putting it on areas like this where there's a lot of detail, that wash can flow into those cracks and pick up those details and um, it just looks better that way. Does that make sense? Yeah, I was, I, I, that's not exactly what I meant. I meant more like you don't want to waste your time doing two brush blending for every tiny little thing like all the leather. Right. Like it's better to, to, to use the time to, to do something nice like two brush blending on something large like the cape on the model. But when it comes to the minute details, the the wash is a better you know time saver. Work smart, not hard, kind of. Right. Yeah. Good. Good point. Work smart, not hard. I like that. So, um, while we're waiting for the, the the face to dry up just a little bit more and for this brown to dry up, I'm also going to just add a wash into um, into her chainmail here. And what I'm going to use for that is the P3 Armor Wash. Okay. And this one you can. You can apply this just straight out of the out of the dropper. Um, you don't need to mix it with any water or anything. Thin it down, especially for chainmail like this, where it's there's just so much detail there. It's all just going to uh, to, to to blend right in and, and go right into all those little cracks. But you'll be able to see here in a second too how uh, how much of a difference this makes. So you can see the the thigh area there. And we put that uh, that black armor wash in there. And you can see that the difference you already get on the chain mail there. So. Yeah, I mean when I when I did the washes on the the trolls, that that was pretty pretty easy to to kind of do, and it it definitely like it's doing here. It's kind of highlighting all the areas. Um, I mean that that was a pretty pretty doable part the washes it's the the going back and highlighting after you've done the washes where it seemed to get tricky for me okay well as soon as um as soon as this face dries up here another another minute or two we'll hop into that and see uh see what we can do with it you just finish this this armor here So are you going to end up picking up yourself a, uh, a storm wall at some point, you think? I'm kind of waiting to see when the hurricane comes out. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. I, I kind of, I think I'm going to try to put together a list for Haley 1 and 2 hurricanes, if you're allowed to have 2, and a unit of gun mages, and just basically cast Temporal Barrier, and every time something gets close, you use to knockback on everything, because I guess the hurricane's supposed to have knockback. So... 
two two hurricanes with knockback, an arcane shield, and a unit of gun mages with knockback, and snipe, or snipe, I guess. Would I, I just feel would be just brutal for scenario. That um, that stormwall is actually one of my favorite um, favorite models to have painted. I I absolutely loved painting that model. It was great. So I'm um, shaking up some paint right now for the face. What we're going to use, Menoth White Highlight and P3 Rin Flesh. And we're going to start pretty light, okay, and uh, probably probably a one-to-one -one mixture of the the flesh to the highlight on your uh, wet palette. Uh, she is supposed to be an elf, so and in, in traditionally, you know, the elves have white, light, fair skin. So, I guess we try to mimic that on this. And this will be your base color that you'll use to uh, to do all the fleshy parts. Be use the same kind of colors for the Nis. The Nis hunters. Nis, um, because they're elves, aren't they? Yeah, but the Nis, I believe, um, there's something in more the, of a bluish. Yeah, there's something in the um, in the fluff that uh, almost they're almost blighted, you know, and so uh, yeah. so that's kind of what you're what I think where that blue comes from. Okay, so there's the face. Start with your uh, your base color. You want it fairly fairly thin coat on your brush. Just keep it in the camera there for you. If you overload your your paint too much. Um, what will happen when you get into to little tight areas like this is um, that paint, as soon as it hits the surface, it's just going to run everywhere. And you're, you you try you want to try and avoid that by keeping the. Paint. And this is. Oh, go ahead. This is paint coming off your wet palette right now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's something I need to go pick up from Michaels or some craft store. Yeah, they're fairly inexpensive. I think the the palette that I picked up, I, I grabbed from Michaels. It was, uh, gosh, ten bucks maybe. I've had it for four or five, six years, and uh, I've replaced the pad once in it. So you're just trying to get one even coat on right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's you know pretty ghostly. The camera's washing it out a little bit, a little bit more than I'd like. Um, probably should come back a little more on that left side of her face right there where it meets the cloak. Let me see if I can get in here under the camera to do that. And you know, don't really, don't worry about right now. You know, see, I, I got a little paint right there. I got a little paint right there. Um, You're not on the screen. There we go. There. Sorry. Um, I got a little bit of paint just on the, the inside of her cloak right there, hood. A little bit on the on the, the strap right underneath her chin there. Don't worry about that at this point. We'll go back and clean that up. Um, what, you, what you're really just wanting to focus on right now is just getting a nice even coat down. Um, and once I get that down, I'm going to take some more of that flesh wash now. From that I used originally, and we're just going to wash the face again. And you can do that pretty much right away. You don't need to wait yeah. for the paint to. Yeah, I mean, down there in Florida, you might you might need to wait a minute or two, um, but you know it's so dry up here that the paint I can work with it pretty quick afterwards. So that's um, that's kind of our base coat right there on the face. Uh, she's got a little bit of flesh showing on her hands here, so uh, so we're going to add that on real quick. 
base coat those areas. And for like the hands and stuff, you don't wash first, just do the base coat and then the wash? Yeah, that first wash that I do is really just if, if I need that extra bit of contrast to see the detail. You know? Okay. Um, it's not something I'm going to do every time. On this particular model, her face is not the best sculpt, and so the extra um, the extra help of the wash to create a little contrast helps a lot. Now, when you're doing stuff like that, I just noticed how on like the fingers, there's like a the little bit of pool of paint on her fingertips. Uh -huh. When the paint dries, that's just going to kind of all go into the model or evaporate. Like, it's not something you need to worry about. Like, oh, there's too much paint. It's going to... Yeah, the, the It's paint, mostly just water. Yeah, the, the paint's a little heavy right here. What that's going to do is um, uh, fill that detail a little more um, than it would the detail around it. Um, you can see I'm kind of wicking it off right there. Um, and, and I'm not going to worry too much about how how even that looks right now because this area of the, of the palm and in between the fingers that's going to get washed and shaded and so once that's done and I pick out some of the highlights on the finger edges here um, you won't even notice that at, the, at that point. I, and actually that was kind of one thing I wanted to mention last week that I, that I didn't mention and that is that I think new painters uh, feel like or they get the, the, the idea that they have to um, like everything has to be covered perfectly, you know? And that goes a little bit to what we were talking about earlier about, you know, when you've got 30, 40, 50 models to paint, you need to be, you need to be accepting. Willing of, to accept a few flaws. Right, yeah, or otherwise you're just, you're, you're just going to drive yourself crazy, you know? And so, um, yeah, and things like that, little areas like that, it may bother some people, and, and that's fine if, if you're that type of painter. Uh, more power to you, but when you're when you're painting an army, I just don't think uh, you can let yourself. I, I can't. I can't handle doing that much detail for that long like that. So. Well, so, I was just kind of like how I saw like the little the little puddle of wet paint. I wasn't sure if that's something that when it, I mean, because what I'm just guessing is that it's mostly water, and so when it dries, the pigment's actually going to sink down and be fine. Yeah. But like when I was painting before, I was like, oh, no, I got too much paint, and I was trying to like go back and get a little bit of it off. Right. But it's it's not a big deal. I mean, it'll it'll dry flush with the, the, the sculpt on the model. Right, it, and and it will. Um, you, you know, you can even see the hand right now. It's it's perfectly. It's dry now. Um, yes. Yeah. Even now. Because it's not an oil paint, so it's not going to stay kind of elevated and leave you know texture and bumps. I mean, right. That was more of my concern, I think. Right. Um, and see, you can take a look at her face now too. You can see how um, how some of the detail is starting to to stand out a little bit there. Um, mm -hmm. And so what we're going to do for um, shadow here is we're going to use uh, cardic flesh, P3 cardic flesh, and we're going to mix a little bit of that into the base color that we just made. Um, so right now, sitting on the wet palette is a two drops worth of paint. One drop of the men off white highlight and one drop of the rin flesh. So we're just going to add a third drop of the cardic flesh and, and create this uh, nice warm looking shadow color and it's going to take it down as far as the color goes pretty far um, here's my mixing brush right here you can see how you know you see how much darker and and fleshy peach colored that is compared to what we started with so it takes it down quite a bit and this one, you, you're, you're going to want to keep this paint fairly thin because you're going to be doing um, uh, glazes, what are called glazes at this point. And a glaze essentially is, if you look at uh, this paint card here, um, see the Army Painter ink color right here, this brown color? See it's really dark over here and it fades to a light. That, that's kind of a, the idea of a glaze is that you're going to build it up in such a way that it's transparent on one side and concentrated on the other side. 
and um, the way you do that is you you pull the paint in the direction that um, you want it to go so, so that where you're lifting up the brush from is where you want the color to be the darkest because when you lift that brush up from the surface that's where the pigments going to be concentrated is where you lifted it up from so on her face here I'm gonna as much as I can with how tight the room is I have to work with I'm gonna pull down on the undersides of her cheeks to create shadow underneath the cheek okay okay and again don't worry if you get a little bit on the cloak there we'll cl I'll clean that up and that's just par for the course sometimes when it comes to these tight little areas and also going to want to add some of this color around the eyes and you don't need to be too too clean at this point because this is just shadow colors that we're adding side of the nose the other side side of the nose a little bit at the top of the forehead there and I don't want to take the, the shadow down too far with with her because I don't want that much contrast on her face but you can already see let me get the focus here how that's already starting to add a little more depth to her face right there mm -hmm. and then for the next shade you're going to want to go to a battle dress green and this color you don't want to mix directly into uh, the previous shade that you created um, put a drop on your wet palette off to the side and then you want to take let me uh, pull my wet palette out here so I can show you okay so here is the uh, the initial base color that I just made up our shadow color so this is a one one to one to one ratio of Menoth White Highlight, Rin Flesh, Card uh, Cardic Flesh. Over here, that's my one drop of uh, Battle Dress Green. So what you're going to want to do is get yourself a little dollop of that. Get yourself a little dollop of the previous shade color. And you wanted to do it about a 50-50 mix. And you're just creating a nice intermediate mid-tone and surprisingly this color is very similar to P3 Beast Hide <laughs> so um, when they made these these flesh colors I think that's where they got a lot of these mixes was from was combining some of these these shadows and these highlights and then uh, same thing here working on the underside of her cheek and in her eye sockets and on the sides of the nose just working this color into here this one you want to be a little more controlling with if you can And then you can see the how much the, the shadow is increased now on her face there. And I really don't think I want to go too much further shadow wise. I might um, I think I might just add a just a straight glaze of the battle dress green, but pretty thin down. 
Let's do that real quick. And see, that's too much on the eye there. Yeah, it almost looks like she has a black eye now. Yeah. And see, that's what happens when that brush gets a little too loaded. As soon as you touch to that surface, the capillary action just pulls that pulls that paint all out. So there we go. That's a little better now. So I'm going to let that dry for a minute because um, I want to come back and start doing some highlights now. And uh, let's move our let's uh, move our attention now to the leather here, okay? And how we're going to uh, to highlight that. I'm going to take just straight chocolate brown, Vallejo chocolate brown. Uh, excuse me, uh, leather brown. And the first thing to do with the leather is just to to quickly kind of reclaim the areas that you want to highlight okay you're, you're not trying to repaint the whole model again you're just trying to to, to create where the highlights are going to be okay um, Vallejo colors tend to be pretty thick so you want to make sure you have a fairly thin coat you can see how thin that's coming off on my hand there mm-hmm And I just want to start picking out places where you're going to want that those highlights to be. And like I was saying on the face, where you lift that brush up at, that's where the, the pigment's going to be deposited the most, and you're going to get the, the strongest uh, amount of highlight. And so you just kind of quickly moving over those high points and uh, reestablishing that base color not repainting again just kind of moving along And I'm not even really trying to blend the color at this point um, because that's not the, the purpose here. We're just, we're just cleaning it up, that's all. Try to stay away from the, the really dark spots that the, uh, the wash collected in because you don't want to defeat the purpose of, of what you did all this for, you know. That's just real quick, a single application, and you can already see how it kind of restores a little bit of a mid-tone back to that brown now. All right. And then to highlight this even further, the color I'm suggesting is uh, called Bootstrap Leather, P3 Bootstrap Leather. And what you're going to do is create about a two-to-one mixture of Bootstrap Leather to the to the uh, leather brown and that's just going to darken that leather brown up just a little bit I need to move it up a little bit can't see what you're sorry there you I'm, go. I'm mixing on my palette so I was kind of holding it oh I thought you there. were painting like the boot or something no 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 not yet not yet just mixing the color on my palette so let me show you on my on the wet palette here. Okay, so here, bring it into focus. Here's the Vallejo leather. Here is the bootstrap leather mixed with, on a two to one ratio, um, two one part. Vallejo leather, two parts bootstrap leather, and that's the color we're looking for right there. And you can see how thin I've mixed that. 
Yeah, I think that's one of the things I wasn't doing. I wasn't thinning the paints enough. Because yeah. that, that was what was giving me the big, the like a noticeable line when the paint dried between my highlighting layers and the base. Yeah, and, and you know, you're going to get that a little bit. Um, there's, you know, unless you're going to spend a, a lot of time, you know, doing the blending and the feathering and and the um, the highlighting and stuff, there's going to be um, some of that, some of those those lines that that are going to be left, and unfortunately, that's just um, you know, it, it's based on how much time you want to put into it, you know. Mhm. Mm but by blending the paints and making sure they're thin, it's kind of going to minimize. Yeah, and that's and that's the idea is is you're almost doing a, a little bit of a layering effect here. You know, by, by, by softening one color into another. And you can see how much that, that leather's already changing there on that quiver. How you're already getting some depth in it. Now here on the, the legs, this is where I'm really going to want to make sure and, and build some of the color up really nice because there's a lot of detail in those legs and in, those, in that strapping there. Let me see how much that's improved it there. And, you know, the nice thing, too, about these recipes that I'm giving you, you can keep pushing that highlight as far as you want. You know, if you're happy with it right there, leave it right there. If you want if you want it to be highlighted even more, keep pushing the, the bootstrap leather out further, and you'll end up having more contrast. But, you know, as we're sitting right there, that's a decent tabletop quality, you know. Um, you put that on the table people are going to notice it and there's not going to be a lot of issues with that leather so leave that leave that like it is um, let's go back to the face now um, so now I want to work on on some highlights on the face okay we've got the shadow in there now we just want to do the highlight to do that I'm going to go back to Rin Flesh and Men Off White Highlight um, if you remember my original ratio was uh, one to one, one part Menoth highlight, one part Rin flesh. Now I'm going to do a two to one ratio. Two parts Menoth highlight, one part Rin flesh. So when you did that zenithal priming today that you were telling me about before we started the cast, the paint cast, uh, what kind of um, uh, what was your thoughts about it? What was your experience with it? Did you find it difficult? I mean, it was. No, I mean it was pretty simple. I mean, it, uh, I had primed models black before, so that wasn't really challenging. And then I just waited for that to dry and went back and kind of just hit them from above. And I mean, it, it definitely instantly kind of makes all the details pop and makes all the shading come out. And, yeah. And, I mean, it, and just, it brings more depth. Yeah, and you're not going to see a lot of that as you start painting but it's you know for beginners it's nice because it gives you some of that um, 
the idea of where you can place your colors at, you know? Yeah, I mean, it gives you an idea of where you should do the two brush blending on something or where you should, mm -hmm. you know, hit a hit a face or whatever with a shadow. And... Okay. So you can see how 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 white that uh, that initial high this initial highlight is going to be, and where we're going to highlight on her. <coughs> Excuse me. Let and me... you're using the size one brush right now? Yes, I'm using the size one. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, where you're going to highlight on faces, um, just real quick before we we actually get into it, is um, on the nose. Okay. A straight line down the nose, across the eyebrow, okay, so right above the eyes, at the top of the cheeks, okay, and if you can get in there, the top upper lip. Those are kind of the, the, the places, the general places to highlight. And as you make your highlight um, brighter, as you start pushing the contrast on your highlighter, on your highlight, you're going to narrow it down tighter. So like for example, that highlight you're going to apply to the bridge of the nose, it would have the most extreme brightest part of it being down at the tip of the nose. So that's something to keep in mind as you're as you're working those highlights. And unlike the shadow, these highlights you do want to be fairly um, controlling with if you can. And I'm going to start at the at her nose and just pull this right down. And pull now across her eyebrows or the brow. And the cheeks now, the top of the cheeks right underneath the eye. And I don't think I'm going to try for the top of the lip. I don't know. I don't want to push my luck. Oh, what the heck. We'll put a little bit there. And there we go. You can see those highlights taking place. And this shadow right here looks a bit harsh on the camera. Um, but in real life, it, it actually is blending pretty smooth there. It doesn't look too bad. It looks pretty good. And then for the final highlight, um, since we're doing such a small face here, I would just do straight Minoff white highlight, watered down fairly, um, a fairly thin coat of it, and just use that as the as the final highlight. Maybe add a just a drop of the previous highlight color to it, and you're going to use this color pretty sparingly. So right there at the tip of the nose, and just a little bit on the brow, and a little bit on the top of the cheek. And there's the, the final highlights that I'm going to do. And now we got to do the eyes. A lot of a lot of people will start with the eyes. Um, I don't necessarily um, go one way or the other with it. You know, I'll just I'll do whatever. Um, but for the eye sockets, the way the way that I paint eyes. Let's flip this card over, and I'll kind of kind of demonstrate just real quick on the back of this card, because that's where a lot of guys struggle is painting eyes. So, so there's our white card there. I'm just going to draw a basic eye shape that you might see on a miniature. Get that oriented to the camera, right? So there we go. So there's your basic eye shape, okay? So the way I paint eyes, I'm going to just grab a cheek brush here. Hold on a second. Let me grab one. 
I'll take a dark color like for in this example I'm just going to use the the Vallejo leather color and I'm going to paint that whole eye socket area get a nice even coat of a dark color and that's that's the eye okay that's how I start an eye I used to do eyes in black but I felt like um, I feel like now it's creating too much contrast so now I'm starting to use dark browns dark greens dark dark blues and I think I'm getting a little bit of better result out of it so after I block in that eye with the dark color I'll take the I'll take my eyeball color in this case men off white highlight we're going to use and that'll be that'll be what I actually use to paint the eye and what I'm going to what I focus on doing and it's really easy with eyeballs because the way that the the sculptors sculpt the eyes is the eyeball has an arc to it so you can just drag the brush across the eyeball and very easily pick up just the center of it so that you're leaving the outside edge brown and I'm not trying to keep my coat smooth here or anything and the brown wasn't fully dried but you get the idea so that's kind of step step two for the eye is paint that inner area white okay and then the third and final step for simple eyes would be to then take the original base dark base color that you'd used for the eye socket and you're going to just add the iris and paint that inside and sometimes on miniatures this dark center may just literally be a drop on the eye because um, they're so tiny uh, if you want to start getting into advanced eyes you know you can add you know a couple of white reflection dots you know at the top of the iris to create the uh, you know the illusion of the reflection um, I've even done it on occasion where I've painted the iris an actual color like a blue or a green you know to mimic eye color um, that's pretty pretty crazy to do um, the other thing you can do too is um, when you want to start painting more advanced eyes is to take just regular black um, in this case just Vallejo flat black and you can after you've block, blocked in all the areas where the eye is going to be you could take the take a straight black color and just paint it along the top and you can create a nice illusion of depth to the eye uh, and shadow for the eye um, and then the same thing when I was talking about painting irises and pupils if you can get it in there a smaller black line can mimic that that pupil okay so that's kind of in a rough uh, explanation over oversimplified explanation of how I paint eyes on miniatures okay so for iris what we'll do is um, I don't want to use black because I don't want there to be that much contrast on her face so I'm thinking that uh, we'll take a, a mixture of the uh, shadow color that we made or the shadow color the uh, battle dress green and a little bit of the um, leather brown and just create a, a, a dark nice dark brown color let me show it to you on my palette here does that help showing you the palette when I'm mixing it yeah okay so, um, oh, when, when you get the paints do you put them into bottles with droppers on them or do you buy them because all the P3 paints I see at the store have just caps on them yeah yeah I am um, I've transferred all my P3 paints to to dropper bottles um, I like the control better so and know, then you just make your own labels yeah yeah these are just um, oh gosh what company were they 
I forget what company, Office Max, you know, Office Depot, whatever. You just get mailing labels, and then you go into your Microsoft Word, and you can select the label size. They've got like thousands of them in there. And then I just type them up. And these are um, half ounce bottles, okay? And then inside. You just buy them in bulk on eBay or something? Yeah, I think 100 of them cost me like $30 for the, the bottle, the cap, and the nozzle. Um, when you get them, you want to get streaming nozzles. Don't get drip it, don't get dropper nozzles. Get the streaming nozzle. And then the other thing I buy on eBay is um, are these. These are actually... Uh, Just to help mix the paint. Yeah, yeah. And what these are is... Fishing uh, weights? No, no. Don't use fishing weights. <laughs> that'll, that'll contaminate your paint really quick. These are actually... Ceramic? Uh, six millimeter... Uh, natural lava beads. Okay. Um, so the the natural stone isn't going to disintegrate. Um, it's not going to affect the paint. Um, I would not recommend stainless steel. I've used stainless steel beads before, and they do. What about the ceramic beads? Uh, ceramic would probably work. Um, what I would worry about with ceramic is that they didn't have enough weight to mix the paint as you were shaking. Um, these lava beads are actually pretty heavy considering their size. And um, so when I shake the bottle up, there's there's enough mass there to... Um, you just put one in each bottle? or uh, One or two, depending on the color. Um, metallics, I tend to put two in. Most of the, col of the lighter colors, I only put one in. Um, the darker colors, I tend to put two in. Um, someone's asking in the chat room where I get the bottles from. I will... Um, when this video posts to YouTube, I will uh, provide a link of where I um, bought my bottles from. That way you have that too, Chris. Awesome. Yeah. So here's Because it the, seems like oh, gauging the amount of paint when mixing paints together is a little more difficult when you're trying to pull it out of a pot with a brush than using how many drops. Right, right. And that's one of the reasons why I switched to dropper bottles is because I feel like I have more control over mixing paints. And same with airbrushes too, you know, um, when it, especially with airbrushing because you have to make sure your paint's thin enough to go through the airbrush. And so certain colors tend to um, not need as much thinning as other colors do. And, you know, so if you over thin a paint, it doesn't stick very well. If you, if you under thin a paint, it doesn't look very smooth when it goes on. So, you know, you got to, being able to control how much thinner you're adding and then being able to con track consistently how much you added, it makes a big difference. So, um, so back to the, the eye sockets on Iris here. Um, this color right here is the one I started to mix up. I think this is just a little, little light still, so I'm just going to take a, a, a dot of black on the tip of my brush there and just add that in just to darken it up just a little bit. And that looks a lot better. I like that color a lot better. And then we're going to paint the eye sockets now. And this is um, last week. Do you remember me talking to you about uh, breathing when you paint, and how mm -hmm. new painters tend to hold their breath? This is one of those those times when when I think holding your breath is a bad idea. Um, you want to be able to control your hand very well when you're painting tight little eye sockets like this so so breathe like you're shooting a gun yeah yeah you, have you done a lot of Just, target shooting I, I mean I, I've done enough to know how to breathe while shooting yeah okay well that's a good analogy actually so yeah just focus on on slow steady bre breaths and um, you know try to make your movements um, happen on those exhales not on the not on the inhales Got a little bit of the color on the cheek there, which is fine, because I can go back and clean that up. I'm not too worried about it. What you want to try and do when you're painting the eye sockets, too, is you want to make them look 
as uniform as you can. Um, you don't want them to, uh, you know, one eye socket to look bigger than uh, than the other. You know, you want them to look uniform, uh, look the same. And to center both, you know, pupils. Yeah, when you get to that point, yeah. Yeah. Because some, some of the ones I've seen pictures of online, people got some cross-eyed models. Yeah, you get some pretty uh, catawampus uh, uh, stairs, that's for sure, man. That's not a word you get to use very often, I think, catawampus. I wish there was more ways you could use that word. That's a great, that's a great word. There should be a Dr. Seuss book on it. <laughs> okay, so you can see her, her eye socket is fairly, they're, they're fairly uniform. This one on, on my right is a little, little longer than the one on the left. But I think I'm going to be able to clean that up when um, when I go in to, to clean up the shadow underneath the hood there. Um, and so the next step, step two, all right, what we're going to do is paint the, the sclera, the actual eyeball, the white part of the eyeball. And again, you know, on this, Chris, I'm, I'm not using a, a super tiny, you know, double lot or single lot brush. I'm just... I've been using the same brush this whole time. It's a it's a size one. When you have a good brush and you can keep a good tip on it, um, you'll be able to get tiny details like this. Yeah, my brushes came in, so I'm uh, ready to go on that once I have time. Awesome. Now, I purposely, on this um, right eye here, purposely made that white part of the eye a little bigger than I should have, just to show you that when that happens, you know, don't, uh, don't think it's the end of the world. Great thing about paint, and you can cover up mistakes really easy. You can just take that base color back in. cover up that detail and then when that dries reestablish the the white part of the eye again and there we go out a little bit more and bring this up here to a macro there we go that looks a lot better yeah looking good so for her um, for her irises uh, no pun intended there. I'm going to actually use straight black for that. Yeah, actually, now that I'm looking at it on my palette, that might be a little too strong. Um, I'm just going to add a little more black to the eye socket color and just get a darker brown. Back out here a little bit, give myself a little more room to get in here. And there you go. There's the completed eyes. Now 
And during that, I did manage to get some of the black paint right on top of my uh, brown that I've already highlighted. You can see the glob of it sitting right there. <laughs> so we're just going to go back and clean that up real quick too. focus out here a little bit take an overall look there any questions on on faces or eyes Chris no I mean I I think going back and looking at the video over again a few times will definitely give me a better understanding and kind of seeing you know where to put the shadings where to put the highlights in order to give it that three-dimensional shaded yeah. look I mean it looks really good Kane, Kane has a good face too so when we uh, when we do his in here in a night or two um, we'll be able to kind of hit that again as well. The last thing that I want to do here, I do, usually don't add lipstick <laughs> or eyeshadow to, to miniatures when I'm painting them, but what I will do is is go back and take some of that original flesh wash that I had used way at the beginning and just add a little bit around the mouth. Just to give the, the a little bit of shape and, and definition to the face. A little contrast, yeah. Yeah, and then he has such a pale face. Yeah, and then same with like right around the nose too, where the where the nose, um, and the the eyebrow kind of comes together. And there you go, there's one, one painted face for you. All right, so by now, um, we have completed the, the leathers. Uh, we've completed the cloak. We've washed all the metal areas. Um, I'll go back in and clean up uh, the, the cloak right around her face there. Um, I think what I want to talk about real quick is is shading uh, steel color, shading and highlighting steel color, and then um, what we're going to do for the trim on these or on these uh, green armor pieces. Oh, we forgot the hand there and, and the hand there. Basically, with hands, Chris, I really cheat because you know there's not a lot of detail to them, and I don't think a lot of people spend a lot of time looking at them. Um, but your flesh wash, just dropping that into the hand and then onto the fingers. When you're painting whole units and whole armies, that's the fastest way to get it done. And then if you find that the flesh wash is a little too warm or a little too red for you, you can follow it up with um, some of the army painter washes. And then same like see on this finger on these fingers here, you can see how concentrated that uh, wash is right there in the palm what you can do after it's this dries dry yeah yeah when that dries up you can then um, take some of your flesh highlight color and just hit the fingertips there and the knuckles to give it a little bit of contrast okay. they're really easy to do so all right So shading metals, let's move on to that. We've already kind of, uh, you know, washed uh, that armor wash into the to the chainmail here on the shoulders and the thighs. I put a little bit on the um, on the blade here. Okay. Um, real quick and easy way to do it. Take your, um, if you remember from last time, what we used is the darkest shadow for. Um, the cloak was a mixture of uh, umbral umber and coal black. Mm -hmm. Take that that same shade color and um, use that as a shade for the metals, for the for the silver colored metals. 
um, what that's going to do is uh, it's going to create uh, it's going to do two things for you. Um, there's a, a really I, I picked this tip up from a guy by the name of Matthew Fontaine. He's a, a painter out of Canada, very very talented painter. Uh, I went to one of his painting classes a few years ago, and he just he's amazing, and he can he paints so lifelike and so real. And um, anyway, when he paints metallics, he doesn't shade metallics with metallics. He shades metallics with with flat acrylic colors. And the, the idea, non metal metallic. Right, right. And the idea behind it is, um, you know, if you look at something that's metal, what looks metal on it is the highlighted part, not the shaded part. The shaded part looks like a shadow, you know. And so you to recreate that on a miniature. Just use regular acrylic paint, and um, you know, do a base coat with a with a metallic color, but then do the shadow with with normal flat colors, and then do your highlights with with bright metallic colors. I'll show you real quick here. So um, the idea on the on the sh the sword, we're just going to add a shadow that's going to start here at the base of the hilt and work its way up. All right, and we're going to two brush blend this. And the second thing that this does, I said it, I said that this does two things for you. The first thing is, is it creates more natural looking shadow. The second thing that it does is it creates harmony and continuity in the model. Because you're using the same shade color in multiple areas. And so it's going to tie, it's going to tie that model together better. And it's going to um, you know, look like it has more, more harmony, I guess is the right word. I don't know. I'm I'm not a not a trained professional painter in that way to give you that kind of terminology, but uh, um, you're just going to have a, a more um, cohesive looking miniature when you're done. The other thing that I, I like to do with metals too, particularly with swords like this, is I've on this side I've started the shadow down here at the bottom, and the, the highlight's going to be at the top. On this side I've started the shadow at the top. The highlight will be at the bottom. So on this side, I'm going to reverse it, shadow at the top, highlight at the bottom, uh, reverse it to what I was doing on the other side. And that just also kind of gives a little bit of three-dimensional depth to the, to the miniature as well. Now, something I've seen people do for bigger swords with that is on like, on like a big broad sword or something is like on the, the same side of the blade, on, they do it top to bottom and bottom to top on the two sides like where the beveling is in the center uh -huh. of the blade. Yeah. And it seems to create a good effect too. I mean, I, obviously her sword is not large enough to try to do something like that, but on like a model that's carrying like a big two-handed sword. Yeah, on some of the um, some of the uh, circle stuff I've painted, I've done that. Um, Chromax. So like the, the warp of stalk, stalker probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chromax axe, I've done that too as well. So, um, But I'll show you something you can do on her sword because yes you're right it is a little bit on the small side. Um, and hopefully you never have to use it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it did, it, uh, uh, P. Iris and Epic Iris have, have won some games for me man. I've, uh, I've had some crazy assassinations where, where they've pulled off some shots where um, a caster had like you know one or two points left on him, and Iris still had a shot that she could take and and took it and and either sniped or just rocked. No, I mean hopefully she never has to use her sword. Oh yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. If you never want her in melee. Yeah, I'll tell you though the best the uh, best caster assassination I've ever had. Um, I forget the 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 war caster I was playing. I think it was I, I was playing Menoth. I was playing. Um, uh, probably P. Krios or uh, or High Reclaimer since they're the two that I play the most. And um, my opponent was playing Ivan, uh, I mean Irus from Cador. And um, I'd gone for an assassination. It was Krios. I remember this now. I'd gone for an assassination. 
left Irusk with like three points on him. The last model, because my dice hated him. He was knocked me. down for your feet? Or? Yeah, yeah, he was knocked down. Yep, he was knocked down, and and uh, my dice hated me, so I was doing no damage on my rolls. And the last model that I had to activate was my uh, mechanic, my Menoth mechanic. So I charge him in. He rocks the damage dice. I had to roll, like, box cars to kill him, or, and that's what I rolled. And At least he, it was uh, an auto hit. Well, well um... Uh, to to kill him, excuse me, as far as the amount of damage that he had to do for arm. And no, stuff. I know, but I'm saying, but at least your mechanic wasn't having to make a, an attack roll. Right, yeah, you know, auto hit because of the melee, right, yeah. So, uh, anyway, next week, the the, the following week, I, I show up at the game shop and that mechanic is painted. He, he earned his paint job, man, let me tell you. So, um, color I'm using here for the highlight on the sword is Quicksilver, P3 Quicksilver. Um, keep it fairly thin because you're going to kind of glaze this on and um, you know, just start pulling up to where you want that uh, that highlight to be and then just kind of softly while that paint's still wet just blend that that transition in a little more so there you go on our now that, that new brand of paints that you were posting on the other day oh um, yes yes Oof. Is that something you would recommend, you know, ordering instead of the P3 metallics, or? You know, I, I'm I'm gonna say I'm gonna say hold off on them, and and the reason why, is because these P3 paints, you know, they cost you what two and a half bucks, two and a quarter, something like that. Um, these scale 75 paints, they're made in uh, in Spain, and uh, there's no uh, U.S. retailer that's directly importing them. Um, so you're paying premium prices for them, and for the same size bottle, um, you're paying four to six dollars a bottle. So it's a lot more expensive. Here's what uh, here's what one of them looks like. Scale 75 color. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to dissuade you from them. I'm just I think being a newer painter. Um, you're going to get more use out of the P3 colors because there's a lot more flexibility in them. Um, the Scale 75s are great, um, but you're paying a, a premium for them right now. And gotcha. where you're just starting out painting, um, I, I don't know if it's... It, I can't tell you what if it's worth it to you or not. Um, if I was in your shoes, I would not buy them yet. I would wait until your skill picks up a little bit more. Um, because I've been playing around with some of the non-metallic colors today, and they're definitely there's definitely a trick to using them. They, they they don't it's it's really odd. They don't have the coverage that some of the P3 paints have, but what they do have is a is a really strong color intensity to them. Um, they're almost like a they're almost like an ink in that sense that there's a transparency to them, but a really intense color to them as well. And so my guess is, 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 or how I'm planning on using them, um, and this is on the recommendation of a friend, is after I do all my airbrushing and everything, and I've got those shadows and those highlights blocked in, I'm going to use these colors to go back in and, and clean those up. Because the coverage on them isn't necessarily the best, but the color on them is, is marvelous. So, so almost like basing with them after you have all your shading done? Right, right. But then, you know, you take this guy here, and, and I don't mean to show someone else's commission while I'm on your time, but, um, you know, take a look at those metallics on that uh, on that avatar. I mean, those are gorgeous. Yeah, I mean, they have a really good reflection on them. Really good reflection. And I'm sure it looks even better in person. Yeah, really good reflection and a great transition from what I was using as the highlight color down to what I was using as the shadow color. Um, and these metallics, the coverage on them is amazing. Uh, especially the gold. I've, I have never had a gold. I've never painted with a gold that I've been able to cover an area in one coat. And the gold that I used as the base color for this was a single coat. Um, and I, I was blown away by it, man. They were, they were outstanding. So, um, so if you want to pick up the metallics, pick up the metallics. But some of those other colors, um, you know, maybe wait on. So. This is the um, this is the box set here. Let me grab it. That the golds come in. 
Uh, they call it their uh, Metal and Alchemy series. Bring the focus. Okay. Yeah, that's it right there. And um, this is the Golden series. And it's just, it's been a fantastic, it's been fantastic. I've been, I've been on cloud nine with those colors since, since I got them the other day. <laughs> All right. So, um, you can see Iris is, is sword though. Now I, I put a highlight on there. We've got a shadow on there. So you got a little bit of contrast going on, uh, generally with chain mail like this. Um, I'm, I don't highlight, uh, the chain mail. Um, if you choose to do that, what you can do, um, people knock this technique, but it works. And if it works, I'm going to use it. But I would um, do a little bit of dry brushing to get a little That's bit of what a highlight. That's thing you were going to say. Yeah. Um, get yourself a nice flat brush. Um, get your highlight color. Dab a little bit of it off on a towel. And then just very, very lightly. Just pick up some of the edges there, and all you're doing is just just highlighting it, just cleaning it up. You know, and I'm not going to use a highlighting technique on on a on a high end commission that I'm working on, you know, but something you know like this that's just going to go on a table. I'll I'll dry brush it all day. <laughs> I have no. I have no shame in that. It's a technique. It works great. Nothing wrong with it. So, um, and you can go. You can do the opposite too on her bayonet here. You can actually put the highlight color down first, okay, and then go in with the the shadow color and just shade that directly, and you'll get a little bit of a brighter metallic finish. Let that dry for a minute. Um, another thing to show you here is on her um, on her crossbow. Uh, you want to create a nice wood effect on that. Great way to do that, really quick and easy. Start with uh, Vallejo P3 Brown ink, and you're going to wash. You're going to apply two brown washes to to the crossbow to create a wood effect. And you'll just use straight ink. Um, it comes out of the bottle fairly red looking. And I'll actually use this, this brown ink sometimes on faces um, to add a little bit of a flushed look to the cheeks or um, on the eyebrow you know, the brows, you know, someone, you know, to express anger or something like that. That's a good place to use that. Right. So once that red ink dries, it should just take a few seconds for it to dry. It dries pretty fast. What I'll do next is um, I'll take a little bit of my Menoth white highlight, a little bit of that leather brown color that you made or you had, and mix up a nice off color white, brown based, tan based white, and then um, get a nice fine tip on your brush, and then very Or you just add some very thin horizontal striping to the wood uh, to mimic wood grain. And then take some straight Menoth white and add a little more wood grain. So you're creating a you know, kind of a double illusion there of, of, of wood grains and striping. And 
and then go back on with the brown ink and just base coat it again. And that the white stripes will still show through, looking like wood grain. But you end up having a nice red, brownish uh, wood color to go with the go on the crossbow. And if that's because if you went too brown, it would just tie into the the leather. Right, right. Too much. And, and what I was going to say is, if that's too red for you, it's it's showing up a little more red on the camera than than it actually is. If that's too red for you, you can just wash this again with some Army Painter ink. Um, the same brown okay. that you used for the for the leather and that'll tone it down a little bit and actually pick out a little bit of the detail a little more in fact why don't we just do that say on camera it's looking really red yeah yeah I'm, I'm looking at my screen right now and seeing that it's like lipstick red on the camera yeah it's not quite that um, but uh, yeah it is looking kind of red so We'll tone that down a little bit for you. You see that instant feedback, man. That's amazing. Technology today, right? Yeah. I, mean, I don't know if I'll be able to spend all the time that you'll be painting the galley and watching. Oh, and, and I'll have to you trust know, you for that one. A big commission like that, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know how much of that, honestly, I'll stream um, just because. I don't know if I could fit the galleon under my camera. <laughs> that thing is so big. So uh, with the but, with the colossals, do you typically paint them in pieces and then put them together? I do, and I'm going to show you a little bit of that when we get to your centurion on Saturday. Um, okay. Uh, share with you some tips on how to paint um, jacks a little faster. Um, there is a little bit of a drawback to it because you know you don't have. Um, you kind of have to wait to play them until they're painted, you know, because they're they're not assembled. But I also think you can paint them faster this way. So for for me, it's it's you know six in one hand, and half dozen in the other. But you know, for others, it's a it, it's it, it all depends on your preference. So, um, but as that as that brown wash is drying, it's definitely toning down the red effect of that um, of that initial ink wash. Yeah, it's looking good. Yeah. So um, for the brass color, what we're going to paint brass on her is going to be the, the hilt of the sword. Um, in fact, when I'm thinking about it too, let's just add that in there. Um, the hilt of the sword, we're going to do brass. Um, the detail on the crossbow, we're going to do brass and then the edging on these green armor plates we're going to do in brass. And the color I'm recommending for that is, um, I think it was either bright bronze or brassy brass. Let me look back at my card here. That's the other reason why I keep these cards is so I can keep the color straight. So bright bronze is the color we're looking for. It went really well with that green when we were looking yeah. at it before. Yeah. The Lejo game color, bright bronze. I keep thinking I'm dyslexic whenever you hold the bottles up. Oh, is is the are the words backwards? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> oh, interesting. Um, all right. So, uh, so this color is fairly thick out of the bottle. Um, if you're having problems with uh, with it covering smoothly, try mixing it with a little bit of that um, uh, leather color. The, the Vallejo Leather Brown. Um, that helps helps its coverage a little easier. Okay, so mixing metallics with non-metallics is... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I do that all the okay. time. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, so, like, if you had, like, a like the pig iron and you mixed a little blue into it, it would kind of give it just, like, a blue tint? It, it, it would give it a blue tint. Um, now, the reasons why I mix um, normal colors in with, the, with metallics isn't to change More the for coverage. Yeah, it's not to change the cover color of them, it's to get better coverage out of them. So okay. Um, if you're trying to change the color of a metallic, I would recommend using inks. Cuz you're going to get a lot okay. better um, 
change in the pigment. Yeah, yeah. Now on, on Iris here, I'm not going to recommend just because it's so small that you take the time to highlight this, uh, this brass color. Um, but I did include on the card that it's I It's almost a highlight in its own. Right. I um, mean, since it's just a trim. Right. Uh, I did include, though, in the card um, that I'm sending you um, what to highlight it with if you choose to do that, um, you know, in the future. Okay. So. Yeah, like maybe on the sword hilt, you would hit it with a little bit of a highlight. Yeah, because I think you've got a larger enough, area. Yeah, you've got enough surface surface area there, and and maybe I'll just show you real quick too how to how to highlight that. I mean, it's just like like the metallics. I mean, just like the uh, silver metallic we did. Um, the other thing you can do if you're having problems with metallics uh, covering is base coat the area first. In a, in a non metallic color. Uh, golds tend to do really well over browns. Uh, silvers tend to do really good over blues and um, blacks. So that's always a, a helpful way to do it too. Now with the metallic paints, is it kind of like a, a less is more on a model? Like you wouldn't want to, like on the forge guard, you wouldn't want to use a metallic paint for their entire suit of armor? Well, it depends. Um, I actually am working on an exemplar, I mean a errant unit for my um, Menoth army right now. Um, I just got done assembling them. I was able to track down a, a set of metal errants because I hate the plastic ones. And um, got them all assembled, all cleaned up. And as I'm looking at them, I'm really debating actually painting them in silver and just doing their cloths in, a, um, in the blue teal color that I use for my army. Um, you know, it really depends on, on what you're, you're going for. I think the problem you run into when you start using um, painting an entire figure metallic is it's really easy for that figure to look boring, you know, if, if it's all just metallic. Um, I think washes, yeah. I think inks. And I think um, the details of the model are what's going to help an all metallic painted model look look more interesting. Because you can't like, could you do two brush blending over a metallic, or it would kind of lose its metallic um, qualities? I haven't figured out how to do two brush blending with metallic paints and them and have them still look nice. Um, but like I did on the on her sword here. Um, you know, painting it a base color metallic and then two brush blending quote unquote normal colors on top. Um, that's exactly what we just did and it turned out, you know, just fine. So, um, yeah, but to do that on like a whole suit of armor, it wouldn't be like, like her cape and how we did the two brush blending. It, you wouldn't have that drastic of a, a shading differential. I, I think, I think you could, Chris, I think you could. Um, you would just treat, I think you would just have to treat each individual plate of armor like we treated her cloak here. You know, okay. you, you're, instead of trying to, to cover several plates at once, just focus on one plate at a time. It's going to take more time, but um, I think you could do it. I, I don't see why it wouldn't work. Um, in fact, I might try that and, on those errands and, and see what that looks like. I like the idea. Thanks for the idea. I'm going to steal it. <laughs> there you go. Um, on her cloak here, the little pieces of detail pieces right on the edge, I'm going to paint these in the bronze as well. I've actually been waiting since I started painting this model to see how this would look because I think it's going to tie the color, to the, the whole color scheme together nicely, having those those metallic bits on the top there. Yeah, I'm just I'm just worried about putting this piece down with all the pieces that I'm going to paint. It's going to make them look bad. 
Oh, nonsense, man. You'll get there. You'll get there. Luckily, she'll be in the same list as uh, the Centurion and the Galleon. <laughs> yeah, at least they'll uh, uh, somewhat match then, huh? Yeah, Kane, Kane 1 is going to be in that list, not Kane 2, but I'll do my best. <laughs> Well, and, and I think, you know, one of the things I hope you pull away from this, Chris, is is that, you know, with some really basic techniques and some practice, you know, you can produce some great results, you know. And you know, one thing you'll notice when I paint, um, my brush is very still. You know, I've, I've put a lot of effort into to learning how to control my brush. And I think that's where new painters probably experience the most frustration is their um, their paint coats and their lines not being smooth because they're not they they don't have a lot of brush control yet, you know, and and mm -hmm. I don't I mean it's easier for me to easier to say than do, but um, you know that's just something you kind of got to power through, you know, um, you know what I've shared with you, you know now in the second up to the second video, um, you know none of it's um, None of it's groundbreaking. None of it's, uh, you know, revolutionary. It's just some focusing on some basics and um, and getting it to happen, you know. Yeah, I'll just pay my wife's men off on me before I start my own, get a little practice. There you go. That's a great idea. <laughs> um, the color that I'm recommending for highlighting the bronze is P3 Solid Gold. Um, I actually just transferred this into the bottle the other day, so I don't have the label printed up for it yet. So, but that's an idea of the color. You know, it's a very bright gold. Okay. And um, very simply put, you're just gonna just like we did with the uh, highlighting on the um, on the steel. Now you put the the metallic paints on the wet palette also. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the um, um, baking baker's paper that you put it on top of isn't going to uh, be affected by it. It'll it'll hold up to it just fine. Okay. There you go. Just wasn't sure if they needed to be treated a little differently. No. Nah. There's the highlight. It's hard to see it on the on the screen, but uh, when uh, when you get it in person, you'll be able to you'll be able to pick it out really easy. Awesome. So, she is she is about done. The only things left to do um, are the feathers and the quivers, which what I'm going to do with those is just paint those white and then give them a wash with the Army Painter wash. No need for them to be over detailed. Um, on the crossbow here, um, picking out these details here in metal. I'll get that done and then her basing and that's it um, this model will be done I'll do a quick uh, varnish on it uh, matte varnish just to knock down some of the shine from the two, two brush blending and um, this model will be ready to join your army man and that all that also protects the model too right when you do the the clear coat the varnish you know there's a lot of different opinions on that Chris I, I'm of the opinion that it actually doesn't. Um, okay. Because what's gonna what's gonna make the the miniature be the most durable for you is the amount of time that you put into preparing the surface and the primer that you use. Uh, P3 primer is a good primer, and um, P3 paints are a good paint, and they're actually quite durable. I have miniatures sitting in my Menoth army that I'd never sealed that I've had for several years now, and they're they're just fine. They haven't chipped. Um, you know, if you're if you tend to be kind of rough on your miniatures, yeah, you're, you're they're probably going to chip. But if if you are wanting to do a, a varnish coat for the purpose of protecting the miniature from chipping, um, after you've done all your surface preparation and painted it, you're actually better off to to varnish it with with a high gloss varnish because um, that those high gloss varnishes have a, a better durability to them as far as wear and tear the problem then becomes is you is you've got a miniature now that's all glossy 
So what you do then is you just hit it again with a matte coat. Um, but I, I very rarely do that anymore, if ever. I mean, when I'm doing a commission, if the, the client asks me to do that, I'll do it. But on my personal stuff, I, I very rarely do that anymore. So. Okay, I just thought I had read somewhere that people were saying that it's a good way to protect your mini from being damaged if somebody knocks it over or whatnot. But yeah, and and fine. you know, like I say, there's going to be a lot of opinions on there out that uh, I mean, out there on that, and um, that's the side of the fence that I happen to fall on. Um, you know, your mileage may vary. You know, so um, it's hard to give you a definitive answer on that one. So okay. Um, but any uh, any other questions on on Iris? No. I'm... Okay. Pretty uh, pretty comfortable with everything we've gone over so far. Okay. So um, what we'll work with on um, on Thursday, I'm hoping to have um, Kane all wrapped up and ready to go as far as assembly goes. And um, Thursday night, I'd like to get on on air with you. Um, or if, if you're not able to make it on, I can just do it independently. We can talk about that off air. Um, but I'll start, if I remember right, you were wanting more of the brown-based brown based leathers for for uh, your Signar Army and then that, that off-blue color yeah, like that the we cream. talked about. Yeah. Okay. So brown, cream, and, and blue, like a red, white, and blue, essentially. So, yeah, I remember. Okay. Um, well, the, the orange more than red. Right, right, yeah. Um, kind of something like, uh, let me see here, like a blood tracker brown. Uh, well, that's even not coming off very orangey. Um, let me see here. In the bottle, it doesn't look as as good as it does. Something like that, or were you thinking even more, more of an orange? Yeah, and I... I, I think that'll work. I just I don't want to go too far into a, a reddish tone. Okay. Have you seen? Uh, did you see the cane that I painted recently? I don't believe I have. Is it on your Facebook? It is. I, and I can send you a picture of it, and you can tell me what you think of the brown in that in that one. Um, but that's more of a traditional brown leather. Um, the blue. Um, we were talking about that. This is the color that I I paint my. Um, my men off in. It's the base color that I use for the shadow. It's kind of like what's on the the cutting board right below that piece of paper you put down. On the cutting. Um, like that green oh, spot right here. That. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's actually a little more green. Um, this is the color right here that I I use uh, for my for my army. Let me get the focus right here. And that right there is the shade color for uh, for my men off. Yep. And it's called Meridus Blue, or Meridius Blue, however you say that. I don't know. Um, but is that kind of the blue you were thinking there? Yeah, almost tying a little green into it somehow. Like okay. I, I like the color that you just covered up on the, the painting board also. Like that, I think that's yeah. more the, yeah, like somewhere, like almost bring that in in the highlights somehow or in the shading. Would that be possible? Yep. Let me show you this here. This is a P3 Arcane Blue. And then we got a little bit of... Uh, warm Green. That's um, about two parts Arcane Blue, one part Warm Green. Yeah, there we go. Yeah? Like, that's kind of, yeah. Okay. Like, do you think that would look good with the, the oranges and the the creams? Let's see here. The cream color I'd recommend is the Men Off White, um, white Base. Highlighted up to Men Off White Highlight. Let's put that next to it, see what you think. So there's the there's your cream color. That actually looks pretty good together. 
And then that, of course, would yes. highlight up to something like this here. I mean, because that would be with the, the silver and then... There's your, your highlight to that color. You can see the transition there. And then the brown, let's, uh, let's start with this one here. This is called Blood Tracker Brown. Is that a little too red? Yeah, or no, I mean, it doesn't look too red. I, okay. I mean, it, it kind of has that orangish hue to it, okay. I think, more than a, a deep red. Okay. I think that looked good. Yeah, that's not bad. I like that. That'll. I think that would look good, too. As far as metallics go, um, I don't think pig iron would be a good base color for the metallic, because I think that's going to be a little too dark. Um, this is a cold steel right here. And that's your, that would be your metallic color that would go with those. And then um, I honestly think looking at this, some gold might be nice too. Um, and I can even uh, use these uh, scale, scale 75 golds um, if you want to try them out as well. But this is their, their dwarf gold right there. And I think you'll get a nice uh, nice bit of contrast from this gold because it's actually very similar to the brown that I just put down. Oh, really similar, actually, yeah. looking at it. Do you think almost too similar? or? Yeah, I think actually, yeah, I do think it's a little too similar. Would we have to change the brown maybe or well, if we the gold changed, to something lighter? Yeah, if we change the like brown, that. I mean, if anything, I would think you'd want to go darker on the brown. Almost like, um, sorry, that's my arm right there. Um, what about the, the gold you used to highlight the, um, the sword hilt? Would that be a brighter gold? Yeah, it would. Let me grab it here real quick. Solid gold, it's called. That's uh, that's solid gold there. That brown that you just put down is kind of like a grayish brown. Um, it just looks gray brown. Um, okay. But it's actually I it's like called... that gold better. I think. Okay, so we'll stick with the solid gold then. Um, the brown is is uh, it's called battlefield brown. It's um, really good color. I use it quite a bit. Um, let's get that spread. It out. looks good with that. I almost think, I almost think right here is where we need to be. Okay. The, the white, and then the battlefield brown. Um, the solid gold, the silver. Yeah, yeah. And see, the nice thing too is, I can still incorporate some of this this um, blood tracker brown here into this battlefield brown by using this as like a highlight. As, as a highlight, exactly. Yeah, this would be. This would be a nice highlight for the battlefield brown. And then um, as far as awesome. shading the um, this green mixture that we've mixed up here, I don't know. Um, I'll have to play around with that one and figure out a good shade color for you. But I think we okay. can. I can work with it, though. That's not an issue. So. But, yeah, I think that's that's really good because I I'm trying to get away from the the bluish of because like every signal army it seems is like a blue so I think like the blue green really kind of gives it that that different look. Yeah, it's not too far from the normal. It's not like going orange or red or something that will just completely contrast there. Right. That well, look. I think you're still sitting in the in the same um, family, you know, as yeah. Signar. Um, it, but definitely doing something unique with it. That's cool, man. And then if we put Iris next to it here, 
um, I think you still get some um, some good uh, cohesion. It, she doesn't stand out too much against against those colors either. Yeah, they're not going to look bad sitting on the table right. next to each other. Right. So, all right. So we've got an idea of where we'll start on Thursday then. And um, the, um, the one thing you didn't mention was the pinning. Yes, that's right. That's right. Thank you for reminding me. Um, I will. That doesn't necessarily need to be in the stream. Maybe you could just do like a brief little fifteen minute. Yeah, yeah. Um, videoed beforehand, because I know you're probably going to want to have the model set up before the stream. Yeah, I've got to think about how I'm going to do that, and I think a. Um, yeah, I think a, I may I, th I may have to do that one separately, and then just post that to YouTube for you. But that's not an issue. I'll, but I'll make sure we do it. So, um, so on Thursday though, are you you going to be joining joining us on air, or am I just uh, going to start? Um, I should be on by nine p.m. your okay. time. Okay. Okay. So then we'll just do so, what we've been doing. I'll I'll uh, I'll log on at half. about eight, and then when you're um, when you're ready to come on, shoot me an email, and then we'll bring you on. All right. Sounds good. All right, Chris. Well, I'm glad you like Iris. I'm glad that uh, this is going well for you. And um, we will see you Thursday night. All right. See you then. All right, man. Thanks a lot. Take care. All right, you too. All right. Bye-bye.